Today we're going to start to understand a rather big concept, and that is why the mark of the beast in Revelation is 666. Now most people have heard of this number, even if you aren't an active Bible reader. Let's get right into this. We'll start reading it here. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now let's be very clear. People will have to be careful with this, because in chapter 14, the Bible tells you if you accept this mark of the beast, you will not make it to heaven. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Do not take this mark under any circumstances, even if it means starvation and death to this world. Now, some people think this mark is symbolic. God's perfect number is 777, so the mark of 666 is short of God's perfection. I don't see that symbolism at all. We all fall short of God's perfection. I think the mark will be a literal mark, and it's been foreshadowed throughout the Bible, and even outside of the Bible in real life. That will come in time on this channel. But if you want to analyze why the mark is 666, you always have to go back to the beginning and original sin. Nearly everyone knows the story in the Garden of Eden. We'll just highlight the important points. God creates man and places him in the Garden of Eden, but God warns him about one thing. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, we know what happened from there, but let's read it. Here enters the serpent. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die? For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, this was original sin. Adam and Eve disobeyed a direct rule from God, and they made it worse afterward by blaming each other for their sin. Adam goes off the deep end by blaming God for his sin. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Well, we know the rest of the story. God kicks them out of the garden, which sets off a chain reaction where sin multiplies, and God eventually has to send his begotten son, Jesus Christ, to redeem humanity and die for our sins. This would be humanity's second chance at eternal life. But the characters involved in the garden story were the serpent, which is either symbolically Satan or a serpent literally controlled by Satan, plus Adam and Eve. But there was also that forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, to understand why the mark is 666, you always have to ask these questions about original sin. Who, what, where, and when? That will be the only way to understand why the mark of 666 came into being from the garden. Well, the who is obvious. Adam and Eve were there, and they were deceived by Satan. The what is simple. It's the deliberate disobedience of God's rule. The where can be a little tricky. Some might say the Garden of Eden, but more specifically, they were under the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the when could be a little harder, as there isn't a time frame in chapter 3. But in order to connect everything together, we have to go back two chapters and understand the creation story in Genesis 1. Stay with me. This will make sense when I start to connect everything later. Let's start with the first two verses in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You have to understand this. Before God did anything, what was there? Darkness and the waters. According to this verse, God didn't create the darkness nor the waters. The darkness is just the absence of God's light, and the waters held no form at all. Creation needed God to shape and mold it. Now that we know what was there before God started, let us start with day one. 
Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the very first thing that God creates is the light. Now we talked about this in our video about the morning star and how Jesus Christ was not only the light of the world, but as John called him, the word of God. It is no coincidence that God's first words were, let there be light. Because if you connect the scriptures, you can say these first words that God said was when Jesus Christ came into being as the only begotten son of God. A begotten son because he came out from God as the word of God. He is both the light and the word of God. This is why Jesus is not only the son of God, but since he came out from God, he has the essence of God and is God himself. So Jesus is the light that God creates on day one. Now let's go to day two. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. This second day is very symbolic because this is the only day that God did not say something was good. You can propose your own importance to this as you wish. I think it has to do with the water, which was not created by God. He only divided the waters to place division between himself and creation. That's why I think God did not say anything was good on day two. But if you step back and highlight the only created thing on day two, God created that firmament to divide the waters. Then God names the firmament either the sky or heaven, depending on your translation. Now let's go to a very eventful day three. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. So the waters under the firmament are gathered together, and now dry land appears, which God calls earth. Then on the earth, God plants the land with grass, herbs, and the fruit tree. So God created many things on day three. Then we get to day four. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay, so on day four, God creates the sun, moon, and stars to give light on the earth. This confirms that God didn't create the sun on day one. That was a different light, which we interpret to be when Jesus came into being. Now we'll get into interpretation. In the Bible, stars have been symbolized as angels. So if that is true, then day four is when God created the angels in addition to the stars. Remember, the scriptures always have dual meanings. So the actual stars would be used as signs, seasons, and to tell the time of day and years. But then the angels function is to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and night. Emphasized by dividing God's light that he created on day one, which we think is Jesus, from the absence of God's light in the darkness. This is what John meant in the beginning of his gospel when he talked about the light, which directly inferred that Jesus Christ was the light that was created on day one. And also, if we overlay the beginning of the gospel and the purpose of John the Baptist, who was also sent to bear witness of that light, which gives light to every man in this world, this is why the angels were created. And that is what I believe is the dual purpose here on day four. This is a really important concept to know when you think about how Satan was created a good angel, but his pride got the better of him and he rebelled against the light 
by twisting God's word. But even without the dual symbolism of the angels here, God did create the sun, moon, and stars. Now let's get into an interesting day five. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now, day five is important because this is when God created living creatures, specifically sea creatures and then birds. But then he adds something. He blessed both the fish and the birds to multiply. God starts to bless things on day five. Now let's go to day six. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creepy thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'll stop here with verse 28. There are lots of things happening here. Let's start from the top. This day, God creates more living things, but now from the earth. Specifically, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth. He doesn't make man until verse 26 with this famous verse. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then, just like on day five, God blesses by telling them to be fruitful and multiply. As we go into the future with more videos, this will be a very important point to remember. Okay, I'm going to stop here and explain how the days of creation finally connect to the Mark of the Beast 666. And this will make sense as to why Genesis 1 was written in the way it was. Let's go back to the first three days and the things that God created. Now remember, according to the first two verses before day one, it said that darkness and formless water was there before God created anything. We start on day one when God created the light. I'll start a list here on the right. Then we go to day two and see that God created a firmament to divide the waters. Okay, we can add firmament to the list. Then day three, God was rather busy and we see that God created dry land, which he called earth. And then on that dry land, he created grass, herbs, and the fruit tree. And we put all those on the list. Now that's an interesting list and the key to connect things. Now let's number the things that God created. Do you see it? Oh, wow. The sixth thing that God created was the fruit tree. Oh, come on. That must be some kind of coincidence, right? You might think I'm reaching here to make this numerical connection. But just wait, this gets better. Now let's skip over the stars on day four and go to the living creatures starting in verse 20 on day five. We start with sea creatures, make a list here, then birds, and put that on the list. Two types of living things were created on day five. Now let's go to day six. And if we go in order, God created the cattle, creeping things, and then beasts of the earth and put all three of those on this list. Then after those things were created, then God created mankind. And this completes the list of living creatures. You know what's coming. If we place numbers in front of living creatures and bam, mankind is the sixth created living creature. Do you think that's a coincidence that both the fruit tree is the sixth thing created and also mankind as the sixth living thing? I don't think that's a coincidence. Not at all. So let's go back to the scene in the Garden of Eden in the place of original sin. We have the serpent, which we know from the Bible to represent Satan. He tempted Eve to question God's rule, or you could say his first law, by taking a bite of the fruit from the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree of knowledge was a fruit tree. We don't have to know what kind of fruit it is. I think I know, but that is not important right now. Just that it was a fruit tree. 
And out of the things that God created, the sixth thing being the fruit tree is the connection from the mark of the Antichrist to the Garden of Eden. This is where original sin occurred, and that is the first six. Then we know that Satan first deceived Eve, then Adam to eat from the tree. Satan got both of them to eat. The sixth created living creature, mankind, had sinned. This was the who. Satan got mankind to sin against God, and that is the second six. But if you're keeping score, the mark of the beast has three sixes. Where does that third six come from? Now we have to go back to the creation story in chapter one to tie it all together and find the connection to that third six. I know what you're thinking. Mankind was created on the sixth day. That's the third six. Well, kind of, but not for that reason. Let's zoom in on verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, when God blessed mankind, the key thing here is that he gave mankind dominion over the fish, the birds, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The sixth day is when God gave dominion to mankind. Now, some of you might be confused here in how this relates to mankind, Satan, and Jesus as our king. Let's check with something that Jesus said before he died. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. Now we know that Jesus had to die for our sins, but if we highlight verse 31, Jesus is clearly referring to Satan here as ruler of the earth. But when did Satan become ruler of the earth? He became the ruler of the earth way back in the Garden of Eden. That is when he became the king of the earth. Now in about a year or so, I'll do a longer video explaining how Satan became ruler of the earth. But for now, we just have to know that the Garden of Eden was when he became the ruler. And that is the connection to the third six of the Mark of the Beast. This is the when he took the six-day blessing of dominion from mankind. Let's take the blackboard and place it full screen to summarize this. The first six is the where this occurred. They were under the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree was a fruit tree, and fruit trees were the sixth thing that was created by God. The second six was the who. Satan deceived Eve and then got both Adam and Eve to eat from the forbidden tree of knowledge. Mankind was the sixth living thing created, and Satan got both of them to sin against God's one rule. And the third and final six comes from the when. It's the six-day blessing of God when God intended to grant mankind dominion over all the other living creatures. This is the biblical connection as to why the mark of the beast is 666. This is the who, what, where, and when Satan achieved dominion over the world. Now you can understand the parallel between Satan in the garden and what the Antichrist will do in the end. He will be openly challenging God by having dominion over the world and over all of God's creation. And think about this parallel. We know from Revelation that the Antichrist will control the world's food supply. And in order to live in this world, you will have to take his mark to eat his forbidden food. This is also like Satan in the Garden of Eden getting Adam and Eve to sin against God by eating the first forbidden food. These parallels are always there. God is giving humanity another chance not to eat something forbidden. And once again, eternal life is at stake. We know how it ends. The Antichrist will only succeed for a limited time. The faithful people of God will resist and not eat his food. And then the glorious day of Jesus Christ will come and save everyone who won't take the mark. Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior will become the rightful ruler of the next world to everyone who obeys God's rule. Stay tuned for more videos about the mark of the beast. This mark has been foreshadowed throughout the Bible. You will see people, places, and times marked for Satan with the number 666. Thanks for watching, and may God grant you the strength to resist the temptation to eat the forbidden food. May God bless you all.